1997, I was a trainee at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. And a 25-year-old kid came into the center with a germ cell tumor in the brain, the lung, and the liver. And the doctors there, some of the great cancer doctors in our country said, chemotherapy is gonna make you sick. Spend your last couple months with your family because that's what counts. Go home to Texas, be with your mother, your friends, because you have months to live. Well, this kid went to Indianapolis and he received platinum, the same thing in my wedding band. He received it because some goofball doc, and I use that term endearingly, to put two, two platinum electrodes in a gel and said, do cancer cells like electricity or not? And the cancer cells didn't care about the electricity, but the platinum killed some of the cells. So they gave it intravenously to this 25-year-old. A year and a half later, he won his first of seven tours de France. Lance and I were on stage a few months ago, and he said, Agus, why did platinum cure me? Why am I able to do and help patients with cancer, continue to be an athlete? Why? And I said, I have no idea. And so the problem with modern medicine today is that most of the drugs we have, we don't know how they work. I can't tell you why platinum cured Lance Armstrong. I can't tell you why most of the things we're doing have an outcome and what those outcomes are. My field is the same field who in the 1950s and 60s were all advocates for various cigarettes. All of the ads, or many of the ads at that time, showed a physician saying, smoke Camel, smoke Marlboro, it's better for you, it's better for your throat. My field in the 70s said, have margarine, not butter, and we killed 2.8 million people by that recommendation. My field over and over makes proclamations and statements with no data behind them. And so what I'm going to tell you today is a new way of approaching health. So I wrote a book called The End of Illness. I submitted it originally to the publisher last year, and I got a call a couple weeks later from the publisher, and I had called it, what is health with a question mark? And the publisher called me up and said, Agus, Steve Jobs just called and changed the title of your book. And I said, he did what? I, I called up Steve and I said, Steve, why would you call the publisher and not me? And classic Steve said, well, it's the publisher's job to market the book, not yours. But he said, if you put the word health in the title, people turn off, their eyes roll back, and you'll lose them. Health is a bad connotation in our country. Health is a bad connotation in the world. And that obviously needs to be changed. And I think we can do it. The reason I called it what is health is because I don't know the answer. Any engineer will tell you the way to optimize a system is to have a parameter on which to optimize. But what is health? Is it your age? Is it your cholesterol? Is it how you feel? Is it how you look? How do you define health? Well, obviously, it's difficult to talk about health in front of the president of Israel, who in 578 weeks will turn 100. And so it's certainly... <laughs> but I want to call for a new definition. I want to start to look at the facts. And so let's look at the facts one by one. So first of all, our notion of exercise in our country. And in every country in Europe, is an hour at the gym or an hour with the DVD doing your exercise. But look at the data. Sitting at your desk for the next six hours is akin to smoking a pack and a quarter of cigarettes on a health basis. One of the most remarkable studies in medicine came in 1953. And it was a paper that wasn't quoted for over 50 years, where they looked at the 26,000 workers in the British Transit Authority. Well, half were the ticket takers that walked up and down and took the tickets on the bus, and half were the bus drivers that sat there and drove the bus all day and sat 90% of the time. Well, they lived in the same neighborhood, they ate the same food, they had similar lifestyles, and yet there was 70% heart disease in the ticket takers than the bus drivers. There was 50% less cancer in the ticket takers than the bus drivers. So our notion was wrong. The key is to move during the day. The key is to get up every half hour and walk. To design office places and workplaces 
and environments that encourage this. Instead of putting parking places right next to where you work, put them three blocks away. What about concepts like vitamins? So again, not data-driven. In fact, if a woman over the age of 70 takes high-dose vitamin D to actually increase her level for a year, she will increase the rate of bone fractures by 26%. If anybody takes calcium with or without vitamin D, they increase the rate of cancer, by, I mean of heart disease, by 30%. There is yet to be a study in history showing a benefit to any multivitamin or supplement. In fact, finally, last week, the U.S. government issued a statement saying that we no longer recommend calcium or vitamin D in any person. Why were people taking, for example, the calcium and vitamin D? Well, because as you get older, bone density goes down. Well, lower bone density? is not a deficiency of calcium or vitamin D. It's a genetic condition. And we know the genes for osteoporosis, yet we want to take supplements to try to go around it. Remember, evolution selects out for who has good children. It doesn't select out for who lives till the age of President Perez. And so in order to optimize these things, we need to go back and look at the data. If a woman takes a multivitamin, this was a study of over 26,000 individuals of over two decades, her risk of death is 15% higher. Yet we as a society spend more on vitamins in the United States than we do in all medical research. We in our country, and again, walking through the streets of Israel, it is astonishing the amount of tobacco products that are used. Look at tobacco. It is clear in the state of California where I live, 26% of healthcare costs are related to tobacco. Clearly heart disease and cancer, dramatic increases to tobacco, yet we allow it to happen. People like Michael Dell, the CEO of Dell Computer, who has over 100,000 employees, are heroes because they said, listen, you're welcome to smoke at Dell Computer, but we're gonna charge a two and a half fold difference in health insurance premiums to the smokers and the non-smokers. Smoking is your right. Taking a vitamin is your right, but healthcare is not a right, it's a privilege. And if one is going to, as a society, allow these behaviors, one can't charge people equally in that regard. Why not, in the country of Israel, put a tax on tobacco and increase that tax? And the money raised every year will go to understand and fight these diseases. Not in the way we've done it over the last five decades, because it hasn't worked. The death rate from cancer from 1950 to 2008, the last year we had statistics in the United States, hadn't changed. So despite spending tens of billions of dollars a year, we've done nothing to impact that death rate. We need to think of it differently as a complex system, which is what it is. And look at the data. If everybody in the United States over the age of 40 took a baby aspirin a day, right, $3.11 a year per person, we would save over $90 billion a year in health care costs. Because aspirin will reduce the rate of death, and death is a bad side effect death of cancer by 36%. Aspirin will delay heart disease, and yet we make these things optional. Statins, which for a 90-day supply at some of the big chain stores in the United States cost $9, will decrease or delay heart disease by over a decade, will decrease the rate of cancer by over 26%. So again, looking at these as a society in the United States, Healthcare costs is 16.5 to 17% of GDP. In Israel, it's over 8% of GDP. We can't make these things optional anymore. We have to take actions on prevention. We have to bring back responsibility to healthcare. We have to be transparent with the data and start to look at it and say, listen, any behavior you want to do is your right, but you're gonna have to pay the price. Society will not pay that price. And so the problem with the complex emergent system, 
which is what we are, is that it's almost impossible to understand. Yet any engineer will tell you, you can control a system you don't necessarily understand. If I ask my 12-year-old son, how do you stop a train? His answer is, you pull the brake. He doesn't say, what's the speed of the train? What's the temperature of the track? What's the wind speed? What's it made of? He says, you pull the brake. You ask a climate modeler what's happening with the weather. He or she will go outside and look at the shape of the clouds, the wind speed, the temperature, and they can make predictions. Yet in my field, we don't do that. We take some random data elements and we try to look about what to do. When you search on Google, your search today is better than your search yesterday. It's iterative. It look where you went yesterday and it makes the search better every day. Yet in my space, in what I do, I'm the same as I was a decade ago. I don't learn from every encounter, and yet we can. We need to start to collect data. People who give their data for medical research are heroes. They're going to be part of the solution going forward. We as a society, governments, countries, the state of Israel needs to say, listen, we're going to choose common data elements. Believe it or not, we don't have them in our space. Right? You call it a broken leg, and you call it a fraction leg, and our databases don't talk. We haven't come up with standardized terms. Somebody needs to step forward and do that, and then we could start to learn from every experience and create more of those Lance Armstrong effects. In my country, in the state of Israel, we are so good at reporting the negative. I have to write a letter to the FDA whenever I have a side effect from a drug. I never have to report the positive. I never have to report something good that happened. Well, we need to change, and we need to start doing that because healthcare is untenable at the current pace of growth. Things will change if we take a step forward, if there's a call to action. Social media, Facebook and Twitter, as we saw yesterday, were able to shorten the time scale of the overthrow of government. Well, let's start to use those tools to change behavior in health and all of us will benefit. Thank you.